Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's good to be back here in Taipei <coughs> on the Taida campus. <coughs> anyway, a few years ago, I was boarding a flight in New York to go to Buenos Aires. And as I sat down in my seat, I found myself next to a young woman who had just obtained her degree from the University of Chicago. She was very worried about flying, so she wanted to talk. And we started talking. And she told me that she was working for a cloud-based education company. I had just founded my own cloud-based education company, Learning Catalytics. You may have heard of it. It's been acquired by Pearson. So I thought, I better find out what she does. Well, it turns out that her company was making flashcards, you know, these cards that have questions on one side and answers on the other, for smartphones. Now, those of you who know about my work know that I do not place much value on memorization. So I almost rolled my eyes, but I managed to stay <coughs> polite. Earlier that week, I had attended a talk by a psychologist from Washington University in St. Louis, a very well-known psychologist by the name of Ruddy Roedinger, who studies memory. And actually, he studies retention from studying with flashcards. And in his talk, he had shown that if you study with flashcards, you remember quite well for about three days. But if you take students and you have them study with flashcards and then you wait a week and you test them, they remember only 35%. If you wait two weeks, you can barely measure it. I thought she should know this. So, I grabbed my iPad out of my briefcase and I looked up the article, which appeared in Science magazine by Reddy Reutinger, that showed the graph. Three days, 85%. One week, 35%. Two weeks, noise. <laughs> so I gave her my iPad and she looked at it for no more than 10 seconds and then gave me back my iPad and she looked me right in the eyes and she said but we only guarantee that they will pass the test <laughs> my jaw dropped to the floor <laughs> I had never thought about it that way and all of a sudden, I remembered something that happened a few years earlier. My oldest daughter was a student at Harvard University. <coughs> it was great. I could tell her everything about education and how to study. And during the weekend, she would come home with me often on Friday and stay at home. And then on Monday morning, we'd drive back to campus. And I remember one Monday morning, that we were driving back to campus. I was sitting in the driver's seat. She was sitting to my right in the passenger seat. And I look over my shoulder, and she's using flashcards. <laughs> Natalie, what are you doing using flashcards? She looks at me and she says, well, I have to know all these amino acids. I said, I have an app for that. Actually, you know, I do some of my work in biophotonics and occasionally I need to know the amino acids, acids, but I don't use them often enough to remember them, so I just look it up. She looks at me and she says, Dad, I'm not allowed to use the phone during the exam. Now, my daughter and I often talked about 
how to study, how to get the most out of education. And at that point I realized that even a student who has the best of intentions to learn is often constrained to memorization by the assessment. Now, those of you who have heard me speak before have probably seen this picture, which is a very old picture of me teaching. And for 26 years, I've been bashing the lecture as an outmoded approach to teaching which focuses on the transfer of information. That's not what I will discuss today. Today, I will look at the output end of education and I will argue that the assessment too is often focused on the regurgitation of memorized information or the application of rote procedures. And consequently, instead of developing 21st century skills, our approach to assessment is simply focused on ranking and classifying students. And I will argue that we do a very poor job in predicting who will do well in their future careers and who will fail. So my talk has three parts. In the first part, I'd like to talk a little bit about the purpose. Well, I'm not going to talk about it. You're going to talk about it because I'm going to make this a little bit interactive. About the purpose of assessment. Why are we assessing? Then I'd like to talk about some problems I have identified with our assessment practices. And because I don't want to end on a negative tone, I'll end this talk by a few suggestions of how we might improve our assessment so as to prepare our students for a future which is very different than the time that we grew up in. So let's start with this first part. I want you to get together with about four or five people around you. Assign one note taker and write down on a piece of paper or on your iPad or iPhone, whatever it is, as many purpose of assessment as you can think of. I'll give you about two and a half minutes or so. So go ahead, get together. And if you don't talk to somebody, I will come and talk to you. <laughs> so go ahead. Write down as many purposes of assessment as you can think of. Why do we assess our students? Okay. So let's see. I would like, I'm glad to see you engaged, okay? Because I, I, I want to start to think about assessment and I want you to think about it before I tell you my point of view. So, I want to hear back. So I would like people to, you know, report back from their list. Don't read the whole list. Read one thing from your list and then give somebody else a chance. Who would like to start? Why are we assessing students? Yes. To measure learning and teaching effectiveness. To evaluate our teaching. Okay. Yes. to judge whether our learning objectives are achieved. Yes? It's more important to improve the outcome of the evaluation. To improve the outcome of our evaluation. Yes? Because we have no choice. We have to. <laughs> Because we've always done it, and we, we don't know why, but we have to. Very good. That's actually, you know, I mean, we're laughing about it, but I'm sure that, that there is a sad truth to that statement. We're doing it because, you know, this is what we've been doing all the time, and we believe in it, and we continue to do it. Okay, in the back. I'll repeat. 
to stimulate the students to learn. In other words, if we would not assess them, they would not learn. Mm. Mm. Have you ever seen small children? I mean, in a sense, we are all born to learn. Small children never stop asking why. Why? Why? Why are they asking why? Because the human brain is wired to learn. We like to predict. It's a matter of survival, actually. So asking why, trying to understand the world around us, is an innate feature of the human brain. If anything, learning, or education, I should say, pardon me, if anything, education does a really good job turning this innate desire to learn off. And by the time we get the students at an institution like yours or like mine, they're no longer learning because they intrinsically want to learn. They're learning because there's a stick. If you don't learn, you're not going to pass the exam. Sad, actually. Very, very sad. But I totally agree with you. That's certainly a reason that many professors think is necessary, the assessment is necessary to motivate the learning. Okay, sorry about the long reaction, but I had to get that out. I'm getting emotional when I hear that. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Yes, in the back. Power. Ah, to keep our power <laughs> over <stuff. laughs> Aren't all the things that we've heard so wonderfully conducive to learning? Right? I mean, if you stop to think about it, here's the list that I had. And we didn't hear this, but I mean, certainly to a large extent, assessment is used to rank and classify our students. This student is better than that student. She is better than he is, and so on. To make a, a, a ranking order of the capabilities of our students as if we could really capture the essence of the human mind in a number or a letter, to rate the professor and the course in the eyes of the department or in some kind of an absolute sense, to motivate, we heard that, the students to keep up with the work, to provide feedback on the learning, we did not hear that, but I think that's very important, to provide feedback on the learning to the students, to provide feedback to the instructor, we heard uh, to provide instructional accountability, to improve teaching and learning. You know, you all forgot a very important reason. I'm going to show a picture to jog your memory so that we instructors can fly to conferences to give talks and keep our students busy back at home. <laughs> anyway, go back to that list that I had up there and look at the verbs. They're already in contradiction. How can we accomplish so much with one activity and stimulate the learning. So you see right off the bat there that we have a problem, but the problems are really much more deeply. I already mentioned a lot of assessment is focused on road memorization, the regurgitation of road memorization or the road application of procedures, but it actually even goes further than that. I would say that most of our assessment because if I go to most of the professors in my own department and I ask, you know, what is it that you're actually hoping to teach your students, especially in the sciences and engineering, they all say, well, I want to make my students better problem solvers. But if I look at their exams, what I see is that these are actually not authentic problems. They're what I would call inauthentic problems. What is a real problem? Let's ask ourselves that question. What is a real problem? If you have a real problem, you typically know the desired outcome. And the task is to find a solution to accomplish that unknown outcome. You have a job interview in San Francisco tomorrow. You go to 
the airport to catch the plane. You arrive at the airport, China Airline is <laughs> not flying. You have what is called a problem. <laughs> you know exactly what the desired outcome is to be in San Francisco on time for your job interview. The question is how to get there. In fact, almost any engineering problem, science problem, real world problems fits that pattern. The outcome is known. The question is, how do you get there? You're a hedge fund manager. The outcome, the desired outcome is known, more money. The question is, how do you get more money in a volatile stock market? Or you're the CEO of a company that makes some kind of microelectronics product. The outcome is known. You want to make your product successful. The question is, how do you make them successful? So I would argue that for any real authentic problem, the outcome is known, the path to the outcome is unknown. Now if you look at most problems on tests that we give our students, they're very different. We give them a problem and we ask them to apply a known procedure to find an unknown answer. And they're evaluated on the answer. Let me give you an example from physics, an imaginary example. A car is going along a road, blah, 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 and so on, and then at the end of the problem, the car hits a tree, and the question is, what was the velocity of the car just before it hits the tree? As a student, you've memorized the number of equations that permit you to calculate Velocity. Oh, there's this equation. Hmm. I can't use it because I don't know all the variables. Not good. But there's this equation too. Oh, yes, I have all the unknown variables. And you plug them in, you turn the crank, and out comes the answer. 4.2 meters per second. And you're evaluated on the answer. Not on how to calculate velocities because that you've memorized. You know, a few years ago, I was giving a talk on education at a university south of uh, Boston. A very good university. I won't name any names. It's in Connecticut. <laughs> and um, after my talk, one of the professors comes to me. He had been, he's a physicist, actually. And he said, I had something really strange happen in my class this year. I, um, I taught physics to engineering students. And in order to make the course relevant to them, what he had done was to put physics in a real world context. And the real world context that he had chosen was baseball. I mean, there's a lot of physics in baseball. Right, collisions between balls and bats, trajectories of balls, runners running. So in class, he would use examples from baseball. On the homework, he would put baseball problems. On the midterm examinations, he would put baseball problems. At the end of the semester, he was preparing the final exam. And he realized that he had run out of baseball problems. So he put some football problems on the exam. Professor complained to students, we have never done any football problems before. <laughs> You're laughing about it. We should really be crying. Because unless you can apply what you've learned into a context that is different from the context in which you've learned it, you have not really learned. Now, do you see the difference between what I would call an authentic problem at the top and the type of problems we give our students on exams at the bottom? Let's put this in the context of Bloom's taxonomy. Benjamin Bloom was an educational psychologist in the 50s who sort of developed this taxonomy, this ranking of thinking skills from lower order thinking skills at the bottom to higher order thinking skills at the top. All the way at the bottom 
is remembering, remembering facts. Above that comes understanding, understanding the relationships between different facts. Then applying, taking what you've learned in one context and apply that into a new context. And as you can see, as you could just hear from this little anecdote that I told you, even at top institutions, students are afraid of stepping out of the comfort zone of the context in which they've learned. Then comes analyzing, determining what knowledge you need to bring to a problem. Then comes evaluation, making sure that whatever solution, whatever answer you give is valid. And all the way at the top is that elusive creativity that leads to innovation and the creation of new knowledge or new art. I want to put this in the context of something that happened to me. But before I do that, I want to tell you about Enrico Fermi. Enrico Fermi was a professor at the University of Chicago, an Italian physicist who won the Nobel Prize, part of the Manhattan Project. And after World War II, he became, as I said, a professor at the University of Chicago. And he became well known for starting his physics classes with order of magnitude evaluations. Problems that have now become known as Fermi problems. He would step into his physics classroom and before saying anything else, he would say, how many piano tuners are there in Chicago? I don't know. You could guess, a thousand, a hundred, two. But you don't get much confidence in that guess. Another way is to actually try to estimate it from knowledge you have. Well, there's about 10 million people in Chicago. So that makes about two million, roughly, families. So let's say that one in 10 families has a piano. So that means there are 200,000 pianos in Chicago. Let's say that on average, you know, a real piano should be tuned every year, but most people won't tune their pianos every year. A concert piano needs to be tuned several times a week. Let's say that on average, once every two years, those pianos get tuned. That means you need 100,000 piano tuners, tunings, pardon me, in one year. How many piano tuners do you need to do that? Well, how many pianos can a piano tuner tune in one week? Anyway, so you can do that step by step, and at the end, you know, you will over-evaluate some things, under-evaluate others, but you'll end at around 25. And then if you look in the yellow pages for, for Chicago, you'll find that there are actually 25 piano tuners in Chicago. And in the process, you learn how to think, and you learn to gain confidence and to make assumptions. Now, I'm not Enrico Fermi, but sometimes these questions come up spontaneously in my mind. Quite a few years ago, I was painting my dining room on a Saturday morning, and I ran out of paint. I needed more paint. So I drove to Harvard Square, and for those of you who are familiar with Harvard Square, right in Harvard Square there's a hotel. I think it's now called the uh, Harvard Square Hotel, actually. It used to be Harvard Motor Lodge, had all kinds of different names. Anyway, this hotel sits on stilts. It's elevated from the road level. And underneath, at road level, is a parking lot. 20 spaces on one side, 20 spaces on the other, bounded by two streets, Mount Auburn Street and another street. I don't know what that name is. So I drove on Mount Auburn Street, went into the parking lot. And normally what I do when I get to the parking lot is I go in and then there's no spot and I go out into the other street and then back to the other half and then back into Mount Auburn Street and then back there and I go around and around and around until I see somebody walk to the car with keys and I think, yes, and then I, but unfortunately the person is in the other half of the parking lot. So I go out in the street and there's another car that takes that spot in front of me. You know, it always, always happens that way. That Saturday morning, for reasons that I don't quite remember, I decided, you know what, I'm going to stay on the right side. I'm going to forget about the left side. Turn the engine off and then just wait because I can be the first one to take a spot if it frees up there. And as soon as I turned off my engine and did that, I thought, how long is it going to take before somebody frees up a spot? 
I know, I'm a crazy physicist, but you know, these are the questions that come over my mind. I thought about it for 30 seconds and I came up with the answer. Three minutes! I looked at my watch. <laughs> you know what? Three minutes later, somebody came. I felt so good. <laughs> now, imagine we take that problem and we turn it into an examination problem. On a Saturday afternoon, you pull into a parking lot with unmetered spaces near a shopping area. You circle around, but there are no empty spots. You decide to wait at one end of the lot where you can see and command about 20 spaces. How long do you have to wait before someone frees up a space? I promise you, if you put this on your exam, your students will go to the provost or the dean to try to get you <laughs> fired. <laughs> what are some of the skills that are required to answer this question? Well, you need to make assumptions. You need to develop a model. And then you need to apply that model. In terms of Bloom's taxonomy, we're all the way at the top here. Creativity and innovation. Now, look at this list on the left. Assumptions, developing a model, applying that model. Which of those three skills is the one that students hate the most? Assumptions, yes, exactly. Frightening. What if you make the wrong assumption? I mean, it never occurs to a student that you can always revisit an assumption. And stop to think about it. Isn't making assumptions an absolutely crucial skill in the 21st century? It's a type of skill that we can't yet make with our computers or our smartphones. It's the type of skill that distinguishes a top scientist from a lesser scientist, a top engineer from a lesser engineer, a good doctor from a not so good doctor. It's not the ability to solve partial differential equations or turn numbers out of, you know, by applying formulas. No, it's how valid the assumptions are. Anyway, since Students hate assumptions so much. Let's put the assumption in the problem. So I'm going to take this problem, which I think is a real authentic problem, and I'm going to turn it into a standard textbook problem by slowly deconstructing it. So the first thing we do is we're going to add the assumption. On average, people shop for two hours. Two minutes is, of course, too short. Two days is too long. So, you know, two hours is just about right. In terms of Bloom's taxonomy, we've gone down a little bit, maybe, from here to here. But we're still quite high on Bloom's taxonomy. Because you still need to create a model to solve this problem. And I think students would still be horrified. What does this have to do with physics or engineering? So, let's put the model in there now, implicitly. We add one more sentence. Assuming people leave at regularly spaced intervals. So we've removed the developing a model. And now, in terms of Bloom's taxonomy, we've dropped all the way down to applying. And still, students will be horrified. Professor, we've never done any parking lot problems before. So let's now turn it into a standard textbook or examination problem. Here we go. On a Saturday afternoon, you pull into a parking lot with unmetered spaces near a shopping area where people are known to shop, on average, for two hours. You circle around, but there are no empty spots. You decide to wait at one end of the lot where you can see and command about 20 spaces. How long do you have to wait before someone frees up a spot. And you think, isn't that the same problem that we started with? Yes, but somewhere in the textbook or in our instruction, 
we taught the student this equation, which is colloquially known as the parking lot equation. <laughs> the amount of time you wait is the amount of time people shop divided by the number of spaces. And the students have memorized that equation and all they need to know is how to use a calculator. And all of a sudden, we've dropped all the way to the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy, from creativity to simply remembering. Have I exaggerated a little bit? And you know, a lot of students are really good at remembering, uh, becoming little robots. But there's a big problem with that, especially now in a changing world. Because this is the problem. Computers can do this. We don't need the human mind for this type of problem anymore. In fact, it is frightening what computers are starting to be able to do. Things like Jeopardy, playing chess, even writing pieces. About six months ago, I read in the New York Times that, the, that Reuters and uh, the Associated Press are actually using computers to write accounts of sports games. And there was an example of two paragraphs, one written by a human being and another written by this, about the same baseball game by a computer. And it asked the reader to predict which one was written by a human being and which one by a computer. I picked the wrong one. It's frightening. So since computers can do this, in the 21st century, we really need to focus on the top because I predict that just as assembly line jobs have been replaced by, by uh, robots, so will any job that has to do with memorization or the application of road procedures be replaced by computers. And therefore, we must focus our education on real, authentic problem solving. But you see, there's a problem with authentic problem solving. And the fact is that the road to a solution is not linear. In fact, I would say the road to any creative outcome, any innovation, is littered with failures. Thomas Edison didn't invent the light bulb in one step. I think he had something like 300 failed prototypes. Most people told him, Thomas, you're crazy, stop it. It's never gonna work. But failure to him was just a pass to the solution. Nakamura and the others who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago for the blue LED, which is creating a revolution and lighting around the world. I heard him give a talk just earlier this year where he told me that for most of his career he would go to conferences, everybody was in the Indian Megalum Arsenide session, you know, hundreds of people in a session where he was for gallium nitride and other uh, semiconductors, empty, big room, only a few people. Most people said, you know, it's never going to work. Well, he won the Nobel Prize and changed the world. So, when you solve an authentic problem, you try a solution, it doesn't work. You try a second approach, but it doesn't work. You try a third approach, if you're lucky, it works. Unfortunately, our assessment practices are incompatible with failure. Students know if you make a mistake, you lose points. And therefore, our students become risk-averse. However, as I said, in order to really do well, in order to be creative or innovative, failure is a fact of life. So in a sense, our grading is incompatible. It makes our students risk-averse and makes, prevents them. It kills creativity in the bud. I'm going to make a jump here. I'm going to show you a picture. And this picture needs no words. You saw right away what this was. 
And if this picture evokes pleasant memories, then I would like to talk to you after my talk. What are some of the feelings that come to mind when you see this picture? I don't need to, this is because it does this at night back home, so let me close this, quit. So what are some of the feelings that come to mind when you see this picture? Just blurt it out, say it. What are some of the feelings that come to mind when you see this picture? This is not a difficult problem. Stress. <laughs> Stress. Anxiety. Proud? Proud. Proud. Okay. You know, stress, anxiety, aren't those so stimulating to, for learning, isn't it? What else? Focus. Yes. Normal? Normal. Yeah, this is how we do our work, right? There's something else really, really peculiar in this picture. Nobody has said it yet. What else? Look at this. Yes? Do I have to do this? Do I have to do this? I don't know. <laughs> I hope not during your work. But what it, look, look carefully at this picture. There's something really peculiar. And not, not about this picture in particular, but you know, this could be true for any exam. What is it? Something that is actually contrary to human nature. Yes? Robots. Robots, yeah, I mean, yeah. But something else too. Isolate. I isolated? Yeah. Exactly, isolation. Look at these people there. They're cut off from each other, and they are cut off from any source of information. You know what I heard? I heard that for the SAT exams in the United States, you're no longer allowed to wear a watch. <laughs> Soon we'll have to go to those exams naked. <laughs> cut off from each other, cut off from any source of information. Ask yourself, since you took your last exam, in college or wherever it was, have you ever, during your job, encountered a similar situation where you were not allowed to talk to anybody and not allowed to look up anything? Ask yourself, during your work, have you encountered that? No. When we do our work, we can consult whoever we want whenever we want. When I'm writing a paper about nanophotonics or metamaterials in my office, there's not somebody standing next to me saying, ah, you're not allowed to look up that paper by your colleague at Yale. You should have known this by heart. <laughs> I can look up whatever I want, whenever I want it. It's not about memorizing the information. It's not about not talking to anybody else, it's about knowing how to use the information. Then why? Oh, why? Do we test our students like that? How can we imagine that what we measure in a situation like this has any relationship to how well our students will function in the real world? Now, traditionally, assessment has been a summative affair, a high-stakes event, culminating in the final exam at the end of the year. How many courses here have final exams? Could I see a show of hands? How many courses? Show, show your hand if you have a final exam in your course. I don't, so, okay. Most of your <laughs> hands go up, yeah? You know, students are often encouraged to study for the final exam. Unfortunately, those high-stakes examinations promote cramming. Students will stay up and, you know, 
memorize as much as they can, store it into their brain. But the problem is that cramming means that the information only gets stored in short-term memory. And as my anecdote about the flashcard at the beginning of my talk said, that means you forget three days later, or you know, forget 65% three days later. So there's no retention and there's no transfer. You know, something interesting happened uh, a few years ago, two years ago it was. Shortly I, after I'd given this talk on my own campus at Harvard, I was at, in Hong Kong, at Hong Kong Poly, not very far from here. And um, I came back to my hotel at the end of the day. It was about 7 p.m. in Hong Kong. It was 7 a.m. in Boston. December, and I get a text message on my phone, emergency alert system. If you are on campus, stay inside the building. If you are not on campus yet, stay home, stay away from campus. I thought, what is going on? I was pretty far away, so it was not a problem, but I thought, what is going on? So I turn on the TV, CNN. There was my own campus, the building behind my building, the science center. It was the first day of the examinations. Examination started at 9 a.m. It was 7 a.m. in the morning, on a winter morning in Boston. I see fire trucks, police, yellow tape. It turns out there was a student who didn't want to take the exams. So it called up and said that there were bombs in four buildings where <laughs> that was not known at that time, but the buildings had been evacuated and the police and the fire uh, men were looking for these bombs. An hour later, 8 a.m., still one hour to go before the examinations, another emergency alert text message on my phone. Everything is safe. You can come to campus, you can leave the buildings. No bombs were found. 15 minutes later, I get an email from the dean, of the dean of the college, addressed to the entire campus community, faculty and student. And he said, you're surely aware of what happened on campus. I have reluctantly decided to postpone the examinations that were going to be given in those four buildings for three days. And he realized that that was a problem for the students because they had studied for the examinations. Hello? It's a problem? Three days? I mean, yes, in light of Ruddy Redinger's work, it is a problem, but don't we want our students to know for life and not just for three days? And this is Harvard, not just any university. There's more. I mean, in a sense, assessment has two sides. One is grades, which tells people to student, this is your relative standing, your standing relative to other people. The other thing is that feedback on the learning. Now there have been interesting experiments done in England and other places that show that if you take the grades away, students, but you still have feedback, this is good, you could improve here, students focus much more on the learning and the feedback. You add a grade and they ignore the feedback. So actually by adding a grade to assessment, and think about it, how can we capture a person's performance in a single number? Isn't that just ridiculous? I was, um, I have to tell you something, and, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm uh, well, I'm still on time, it's okay, but I was, giving, I was giving a version of this talk, a very early version of this talk, at a high school in California, south of San Francisco, in Hillsboro, the Nueva School, which is a private school which has done a lot in innovative teaching. This was on a professional development day for the teachers. And I started that talk, just as I started this talk, by asking people to reflect on the purpose of assessment. 
And after they're done, just like you, for a few minutes, I asked them to report. And on the second row were four middle school students, you know, 13, 14 year olds. And as soon as I asked, they were the first one to raise their hands. I didn't want to hear from them, I wanted to hear from teachers, so I ignored them, right? <laughs> they, they were on campus not because they were doing professional development, they were there because they were the ushers. Between the sessions, they were telling the people where to go, but they had come and, and sat down and, and, and participated in my talk. So I asked different teachers, and as I continued to ignore them, their hands went higher and higher. <laughs> and at some point, I thought, okay, let me just ask the students, you know. Everything they said had to do with reflection. I like it when my teacher tells me how I can improve and, and you know, what I did well and what I should revisit and how I can improve my learning. I thought, wow, you know, I, I've never heard a student say that. So I, I thought after my talk, I, I, I need to talk to them, right? Of course, when my talk was over, they had to start ushering the teachers again, so they were gone. So I went to one of the teachers of that school and I said, these three students, they, they were amazing. You know, be sure that they come to Harvard. <laughs> and he got a big smile on, it, on his face and he said, we have no grades. They have no grades. They have assessment but they have no grades, just feedback. And you know what? I thought, how do they get students to go to top schools like Harvard? They do. They do because the teachers can actually write much more informative pieces about their students. This student is good at this and is good at that, rather than giving a number or a letter. What does a number of a letter tell you anyway? And think about it. Think about the people you, know, you knew in high school or in college who had always A's and, or 10's or top of the school. Where are they now? Do the grades that we give actually correlate with performance? I'm on the admissions committee for our graduate students. We get, in applied physics, we have about, you know, 32 PhD students that we admit every year. We have something like 900 students who apply. We have to go through this huge pile and reduce 900 to 30. I look at these records. They're amazing. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. You, you look at the records and you think, boy, this is the next Einstein. This is the next <laughs> genius. And then they come to campus, and you see that they can't even tie their shoelaces, so to speak, because the way they've been assessed really doesn't measure the type of skills that are required to do independent and creative work. The other thing, and this is something that I realized only recently, is that assessment produces a conflict in us, in you, and in me. And I only became aware of that conflict when I started to teach a project-based course. Rather than telling my student, here's my book, learn it, it's good for you, I tell my students, we're going to work on some really exciting projects. And I add a component of empathy or social good to the project. And when they're totally excited about this project, I tell them, you may want to have a look at this book. It may help you with your project. So in a sense, the project becomes the goal, not the book and the knowledge. Students work on their project, and at the end of a month, they have to present their project, make a musical instrument from recycled parts. And the first year that I taught that way, I was the one who judged my students. I knew how hard my students had worked. I wanted to give them all A's. I knew how hard they'd worked, because they'd put their heart and soul into these projects. And I realized that we, as teachers, are in a strange situation as being both the coach and the judge. 
Can you think of any other human endeavor where we combine the role of coach and judge in one person? It would not be permissible. Imagine you're a coach for figure skaters and you go to the Olympics in Sochi or wherever they are. And you take the person you've coached with you and as you arrive in Sochi you say, good luck, I'm going to be the judge now. <laughs> Nobody would accept that. But somehow in education we get away with being both the coach and the judge. I've asked myself, how in the world can we get away with that? And you know, I think that's actually part of the problem with assessment. Because the way we get away with it is by hiding behind a thin veil of objectivity, fairness. I'm going to evaluate you in a way that involves no feelings, completely objective. But let's look again at Bloom's taxonomy for a moment. Look at these different skills. Which is the one that you can evaluate truly objectively? It's the one all the way at the bottom. That's the only one you can evaluate truly objectively. Take the problem about the, the car hitting the tree that I mentioned in the beginning of my talk. If the answer is 4.2 meters per second, correct. If the answer is 5.6 meters per second, wrong. If the answer is 4.2, no units, wrong. If the answer is minus 4.2 meters per second, wrong. No feelings, no, no, nothing. It's just completely objective. But are the students truly learning something that is going to be valuable in their career? I'm afraid not. And then there's so much more, grade inflation, cheating. I mean, at all institutions around the world there's cheating, from mine to yours. <laughs> Just a few years ago in a, in a government course at Harvard with 250 students, 150 students were cheating. I argue that cheating is not a problem with the students. Cheating is a problem with the way we assess our students. We consider looking up on an exam, looking up information on an exam, cheating. If that's the case, then you and I are cheating our way through life because we always look up information when we do our work. Why would a learner intrinsically motivated in learning, and as I argued, humans are intrinsically motivated to learn, cheat. Have you ever seen a toddler who is learning to put food in his or her mouth with a fork cheat? No, of course not, because we want to master that skill. Okay, let's end this talk. I have about, uh, I, I want to end in about half a minute, so we, uh, half an hour, sorry. Not half a minute, I can't do that. <laughs> so that we can leave a little bit of time for discussion. So let's talk about some improvement. Four different suggestions for improvement. The first one is, let's mimic real life. Let's not cut off students from information. Because later in their life, they will have access to information. Besides, think about it, all the information you had to memorize, how much of it do you still know? I think very little. I think it was Einstein who once said, education is what is left after all that is learned is forgotten. A very sad statement, actually. You know, take my field, nanophotonics. When I was a student, it didn't exist. When I was a graduate student, it didn't exist. When I was a postdoc, it didn't exist. When I was an assistant professor, it didn't exist. When I was an associate professor, it didn't exist. When I became full professor in 1990, sort of just started, but the term nanophotonics wasn't even used. I had to learn everything about nanophotonics 
way, way, way after my education. Who are we to judge what information our students need to have memorized? We don't know about their jobs. In fact, I predict that most of our students will have jobs that don't even exist today. I mean, think about it. When you were a student, the internet did not exist, or maybe it was just starting. The idea of having a web programmer, if I would have come to you when you were a student and said, would you like to become a web programmer, you, you would have thought, what does that mean? Spider web? I mean, I, I have no idea. <laughs> the world is changing. It's not the memorized information that is going to make our students successful. It's the skills that are going to make them uh, successful. Memorization of information is worthless because the information that sticks is the information that is used over and over again. Why do I know things about nanophotonics? Not because somebody once told me, Eric, you're not going to be a good physicist if you don't know about nanophotonics. No, because I had to use it. Suppose that as a physicist, I don't know what the mass of the electron is. Maybe you'd be horrified. How can you be a physicist and not know the mass of the electron? But if there are plenty of branches of physics where you don't need to know the mass of the electron. And then if one day you need the mass of the electron, no problem. You just, you know, you take your smartphone and you hit the button and you say, what is the mass of the electron? <laughs> And a few seconds later, Siri says, is looking up on the check internet, that. let me check that, she says. And then she comes up with here the mass of the electron in 10 decimal places, which I could never remember. The so, mass of E is about 500. There you go, I cut her <laughs> off. So, and suppose that there's a week in which I need to look that up 10 mm -hmm. times. After having looked it up 10 times, I don't need to look it up anymore because I remember it. I remember it not because somebody told me, Eric, you must know the mass of the electron. No, I know it because I use it and because I need the information. And I think the same is true for our students. It's not about memorizing information. It's about knowing how to use it. Now, you know what? Early in my career, I knew that. And the first year that I taught physics for pre-medical students, I thought, you know, why would these pre-medical students have to remember all of those formulas? So I'm going to give them a formula sheet. So I gave them one page with equations. The next year that I taught that same course, some students had seen the formula sheets and they said, Professor Mazur, couldn't I bring my own formula sheet rather than having your formula sheet? Because, you know, I'd like to organize the information differently. And I thought about it and I said, okay, one index card, five by seven inches, one side only. Only to realize that students develop this microscopic handwriting <laughs> in which they write the entire textbook on one sheet of paper. So the next year I said, you know what, just bring the book. You know, save yourself the trouble of copying the book. The following year, some students came to me and said, Professor, I, I used this other book in high school for my physics course, which I like more than the book that you use. Could I bring my high school physics book? I thought if I let that student bring his high school physics, then I have to let them bring any book they want. So I said, OK, you can bring any book you want. Some students would walk in <laughs> to the exam with a stack of books. The following year, some students came to me and they said, Professor Mazur, could I bring the solutions to the homework and my notes? I thought about it. I said, you know what? You can bring anything you want except another living person. <laughs> but then, more recently, I've started to assess my students using their laptops. After all, you know, we use laptops in our work, so assessing our students without their laptops is kind of crazy, right? Why assess them in a way that they're not going to work? Because that is sure to tell you something that's not relevant about the student's future career. But that means students have access to Google. <laughs> is that a problem? Should I shut down the Wi-Fi so they can't look anything up? 
And then I said, no, of course not, because when they do their work, they also have access to Google. In fact, let's think again about Bloom's taxonomy. What does Google do to Bloom's taxonomy? What it does is it eliminates that bottom level from Bloom's taxonomy. It means that I have to take my problems and be sure that they cannot be Googled. In fact, here's perhaps one of the most important statements I'm going to make today. Any problem to which the answer can be Googled is not an authentic assessment question. I'm going to show you this little video and I want you to look at it carefully. It was, it was actually videotaped not very far from here in Bandung, Indonesia at the Bandung Institute of Technology, which is sort of the number one institution in Indonesia. You've already seen a little bit, but I want you to do two things. I want you to, the reason I chose that is because they speak Bahasa Indonesia, which I'm sure most of you don't understand. <laughs> but I want you to look at it and I want you to decide two things. One, so this is a class at the university. What is the subject of that class? And secondly, what are the students doing? So here we go. Okay, so that first question is maybe not very fair. So I'll give you the answer to the first question. This was a class in a management school there on statistics. Have you ever seen students have fun with statistics? <laughs> now you have. But now, the more important question. What is it that is going on? What part of the instruction is this? Go ahead. I heard somebody say group work. Obviously group work, yes. <laughs> Final. That's actually very close. These students are taking an exam. Yes, ah, uh, isn't that like having a cognitive dissonance? This assessment technique is from team-based learning. If you want more information, go to teambasedlearning.org. It's one of these educational innovations that started in a silo. The silo is management. It started about 25 years ago at a small school of management in Oklahoma. And it's spread across management schools, and now there are a number of medical schools that are using the same approach, and you can find much more description uh, uh, on that website, teambasedlearning.org, including the assessment technique. The first time, but, but it's sort of interesting to find that pedagogical innovations tend to be living in silos and very rarely spread across these disciplinary silos that we have. The first time that I came across it was when I was visiting the University of Delaware as Phi Beta Kappa visiting scholar. In, you know, about six years ago I was Phi Beta Kappa visiting scholar and then you get to visit a number of campuses for three days each. And during those three days you visit different departments, you give talks in different departments, you visit a number of classes and so on. And at the University of Delaware, on my second day, I had a visit to a biochemistry classroom. And at the appointed hour, I went to the building where it was in the classroom. And as I entered that classroom, I saw five tables with about eight chairs each, no students, and a professor with a big beard who was putting pieces of paper down on the tables. So I walked over to him and I introduced myself. And he said, oh, great that you're visiting today. So I, I smiled and he said, yes, we're, we're having an exam today. 
I thought, that's weird. Why would they have me visit a class when there's an exam, right? <laughs> so I said, do you want me to, to go outside? I mean, I had not had time for my email, so I thought this was perfect. I could go outside, work on my email, and you know. I said, no, 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 no. I want you to take the exam. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> what is the exam about? He said, hemoglobin. I said, I don't know anything about hemoglobin. <laughs> But before I could protest, the students were there, and I, I sat at the table with eight other students. My mood became very bad. <laughs> I wanted to do my email, and I was sitting there. Okay. So at some point, we could turn around the exam. It was about 15 multiple choice questions. My mood went from bad to really bad, because <laughs> I don't like multiple choice exams. We had to write down our answers on a little piece of paper. One C, two B, and so on. And after about 20, I knew, <laughs> I was looking at it, I was thought, why do I have to do this, right? I mean, I was sitting there, you know, I, I didn't know any of the answers. So I was just looking around, thinking I'm wasting my time. And then after 20 minutes, the professor took the little slips of paper, individual answers from the students. And then he put on the table one of these if at scratch card, immediate feedback assessment technique. On the vertical, the number of the question, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. On the horizontal, A, B, C, D. At the intersection is this paint that you scratch off that you have on lottery cards. And it's pre-coded by having a star under the correct answer. But of course, you can't see that. So there's only one card per table. Now, the first thing that the students at my table did was to appoint a scratcher. Do you want to be the scratcher? You, you want to be the scratcher. So the scratcher took the card. And the scratcher then said, one was an easy question. I answered C. Did you also C, C? Everybody agreed it was C. So the scratcher said, shall I scratch off C? Yes, let's scratch off C. Scratch off C, yes, there's a star. I thought, okay, so now we're making it a game. Could I please go and check my email now? <laughs> I thought, okay, so we take the exam and make it a game. It's not very interesting. But then we got to problem number two. Half the people had answered A. The other half had answered B. The A's didn't want the B to be scratched off. The B's didn't want the A to be scratched off. And something very interesting happened. All of a sudden, the students started to talk like biochemists. Don't you remember when hemoglobin flows, blah, 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 and so I, I don't know anything about hemoglobin, so I don't know what they said, but they were no longer talking about the answer they were talking about the reasons for the answer, and they were teaching one another. Don't you remember in class, the professor said that when hemoglobin and so on, oh, yes, you're right, you're right, yeah, I, I, I think you're right, I think it should be B. After a while, the group at my table settled on B. Okay, shall we scratch B? Yes? Okay, scratch. No star. <laughs> The great thing of the method is, if you get it wrong the first time, you can try a second time for half credit. If you still get it wrong, you can try a third time for a quarter credit. So look here, for this one they get four points, for this one they get two points, for this one which took three tries they get one point. Here they didn't get it right at all, they get zero points. During this team round, the students actually experienced aha moments. Oh, you could actually see them. They were teaching each other. The assessment became a learning opportunity. It was no longer learning and then assessing. No, the assessment was part of. And the students weren't nervous or tense or anything. And they were interacting with each other. At the end of the hour, the students walked out totally relaxed. They knew their individual score because once you see this, you know how you did as an individual. 
And once you add up these points, you know what the team score is. The final score is 50% individual score, 50% team score. So that means there's both an individual responsibility and a team responsibility. Now, one, if you're interested in this approach, I have to give you one warning. You cannot use an assessment aimed for individuals because one crucial rule in any team-based teaching is that you make the level of everything significantly higher than you would do for individuals. Right, because let's say that you keep the same level as you do as individuals. So let's say the four of us here are on a team, he's the best person in the class, and he sees the assessment and thinks, oh, yeah, I can do this and get 100%. Then in that case, in the team round, since we know that he's the best student, we just listen to him and take his answer. He's annoyed that he has to help us. We don't learn anything. You have to make it so hard that even the best student will only get about 50% correct, so that everybody learns in the team round. So be sure, if you do this, to significantly increase the difficulty of your, uh, of your test. Now, I like this, but when I came back to Harvard, I couldn't get myself to do it, because I thought, you know, I don't like multiple choice assessment. But then, we developed Learning Catalytics, which I briefly mentioned in the beginning, which is a platform to do online assessment using open-ended questions. Right, so for example, if you have a question like this, what is the derivative of 3x squared minus 6x? By the way, that would not be an authentic assessment question. I'm just showing this to show off my system, but it would not be authentic because you can Google it. Well, then you enter uh, an equation, and as soon as you enter the equation, the system automatically um, uh, assesses it. So the students answer all the questions individually, and then in the team route, they can see what the answers are that are given by the other students in the team. And Bess will go, Brent, why do you have 6x and not 6x minus 6? And they'll talk. It's no longer a multiple choice question because the choices are generated by the students, and they could all be wrong. All of them. So if you step into my class, this is what you see. During the individual round, it looks very much like a, a standard exam. It's quiet. The students sit there, except that they have their computers in front of them. They can look up whatever they want. They cannot communicate with each other. So no chat messengers. And then in the team round, things change completely. At first, they talk a little bit, and then they get up to the boards, and they'll start making drawings. We're talking about the right-hand rule here, as you can see. I often ask people to come and visit my classroom when they start, after they've started the team round, and I have the people walk around in my class, and then I ask them, what do you think my students are doing? Solving group problems together, group work. I say, no, they're taking an exam. What? <laughs> and, you know, they can't believe it. And, you know, they're taking an exam and talking to each other and, uh, and they're on. Uh, of course, I don't call it an exam. I call it, you know, a readiness assurance activity. Because I also, in, in the mind of the students, I want to decouple this idea of a high pressure exam from what we're doing. Second thing, second recommendation, we'll go fast through the next three. Let's focus on feedback, not ranking. I've already said several times, I don't believe we can really rank effectively. Let me show you some data. Well, first of all, let me just say, I know plenty of examples of people who dropped out of college and were immensely successful. And I know even more examples of people who came out of your institution or my institution with top records and dropped out because they were not able to do well. So I think it's a myth. We don't know from our assessment whether somebody is going to be successful or not. Let me show you some data out of my own class. This is before I changed my 
approach to teaching. This shows the final grade on a scale of 0 to 100. And this shows an independent test, word-based, of their understanding of the concept of force. Now, the concept of force is one of the most basic concepts in physics. If you don't understand force, you really don't understand anything because momentum, energy, work, everything depends on the concept of force. According to the author of the test, anybody who scores below 22 is still an Aristotelian thinker, connecting force to velocity rather than force to acceleration. And as you can see, there's a huge range. There's some people who, you know, anybody who scores around 10 or below scores at the same level as a gorilla would score. Some Harvard students are like gorillas, you know. It gets even worse. You know, sometimes you find students who score below what a gorilla would score by pressing random keys because they consistently choose the wrong answer. But as you can see, there are some students who did really well and others who failed the class. If you test professors and graduate students and postdocs, they will maybe get one or two wrong. This is all correct because there are 29 questions. This is one wrong, this two wrong. When I took the test, I, I made one mistake. I, I, I must have misread a question. No, I actually made an honest mistake. <laughs> now, look at that. Quite a few students in my class actually scored it. Well, not quite a few. A percentage of the students makes that. But there's a broad range of grades. Look in particular at these two students. The one on the right mastered the concept of force, but got a C. The one on the left was an Aristotelian thinker, but got an A. Is that objectivity, or is it an injustice? Let's focus on skills and not content. In the traditional approach to curricular design, people start with a list of topics. I got this from this book by Grant Wiggins, Understanding by Design, who unfortunately last year passed away. You know, the traditional approach is, let's start with the content. In this course, we're going to cover topic A, topic B, topic C, topic D. Then we start covering those topics in the class, and at the end of the semester, we ask ourselves, let's assess the students. In that case, the course is completely determined by the content. What Grant Wiggins advocates is to start at the output. Let's not start at the input, let's start at the output. Let's ask ourselves, what are the desired outcomes in this course? And then, let's ask ourselves, what is the acceptable evidence? And if we cannot come up with any acceptable evidence, then we've not defined a valid outcome. And then, let's think about the instructional approach and optimize, design it in such a way as optimize the outcomes. If I tell this to my colleagues at Harvard, they all shake their head. They like this. But actually, implementing is not that easy. They'll think about it for a while and they say, in this course, you will learn to understand topic A, topic B, topic C, topic D. But then, you know, you're back at the same thing. You have to have it in terms of action. Solve partial differential equations or interpret medieval works of art in this or this context and, and so on. But the great thing is not only that the course is defined by the outcomes. No, you've thought about the assessment not at the end, but at the beginning. Lastly, we need to resolve the coach-judge conflict. You know what I did in my course? <laughs> it was so easy. I, I, I'd never thought about it. Let's use external evaluators. I'm going to ask my colleagues to assess my students during the fair and interview my students. Let them be the bad guys and me continue to be the coach. Why should I make this Jekyll and Hyde transition from being the good guy to all of a sudden being the bad guy? I can be there and help defend my students. In addition, I think we need to incorporate more peer and self-assessment for the following reason. Nothing is worse than being ignorant and unaware of it. We do not give our students the skills to evaluate themselves. And if you think about it, 
that is perhaps one of the most crucial skills to continue to learn because when we give our students their diplomas, that's not when learning stops, that's when learning really starts. And we, our teachers, will no longer be there to guide them by the hand. They'll have to assess their own knowledge. So for them to learn how to assess is so important. I was going to discuss this, this calibrated peer review, but I'm out of time. I'm being told I'm out of time. So if you are interested in it, go to this URL. And my, you can download my slides, and then I'll, I'll give you a URL where you can download my slides. So you, you will have a reference. But calibrated peer review permits you to kind of crowdsource the grading according to a standard that you as the instructor set, which means you don't have to work after the exam but before the exam because in a sense the grading is done by the students. Unfortunately, I, I will just have to uh, skip that but you can read about it. I want to end with a call to action. And the call to action is very simple but very important. We must rethink assessment because if we don't, and I hope I've convinced you that we have to, we will continue to educate the followers of yesterday rather than the leaders of tomorrow. And unless we rethink our assessment, our assessment will continue to fail to indicate who will be successful and who will not be successful. Thank you very much.